Hey everybody, hope everybody's doing well today. Uh, my name is Pete Downing from Zentegra. Uh, you know, we're gonna get started in about a few minutes. We're just letting a few folks jump on. The, the count is still climbing. Um, so if you wanna grab a quick, quick cup of coffee, uh, we'll get started in about 30 seconds. So give us, uh, just allow some folks to jump on and we'll jump in. All right, so let's uh, jump in. Hopefully, you guys are all here for the FS Logics webinar. The uh, how Office 365 is just the latest thing that's harder with VDI. I got a lot of special guests today, and I thank you all for attending. This is the first of 12 uh, webinars that we're going to be doing between now and the end of the year. It's going to be part of my series called Webinar Wednesdays. So, uh, you know, by the end of the week, check back and you'll see the list of all the great vendors we'll be highlighting. And FS Logics has the privilege to go first today. Um, with me today, uh, I have you know two great speakers and two great technologists on the phone. Uh, you know myself, I am the CMTO of Zentegra. Um, also on the call, I have a gentleman by the name of David Young. Uh, he is the product champion of FS Logics. He's been around the technology as well as the space for a long time, a lot longer than me. And uh, for those who probably know. Gabe, my buddy Gabe Knuth, joined FS Logics, uh, but we all know him from his days at BrianMadden.com. So we have a lot of great speakers today. Uh, I look forward to <coughs> having them uh, chime in and give us a great overview on FS Logics. Gabe's going to be our moderator with Q&A and maybe throw a couple uh, hard questions at us throughout the, the day today and uh, have a little fun with it. Also, uh, yeah, Pete, I got one question already in the chat. Uh, what is a CMTO? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So the CFTO is a, it's a hybrid role of CMO, so it's Chief Marketing Officer, and CTO, Chief Technology Officer. So, uh, you know, I do both roles. Uh, well, one, because I like technology. And for those who know me, you know, know that I'm a technolog technologist at heart. Uh, but two, I happen to be good at marketing. So I also do the marketing and have a little fun with that. So 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 Pete, a little little background on that because it's important. We got the three of us together. Give yeah. everybody on the phone just a you know the thirty second overview of what Pete did before this. <laughs> uh, sure. So my my history uh, goes back to the days of Ardens, uh, uh, which you know is arguably probably one of the better acquisitions Citrix made uh, back in late two thousand six. Uh, the OS streaming technology, which is now provisioning services. So my history, the last 12 years, has been in product management. So I managed uh, development teams uh, across provisioning services, uh, as well as I spent three years on Netscaler, and then did my last stint at Citrix uh, doing Zen Client uh, Desktop Player. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in the end user computing space, and then spent a few years over at Red Software, and as well as uh, Improvada in the security space. So my last 12 years have been mainly product management, but my roots are IT and sales engineering, so as well. And I think that's important for everybody to know, you know, my roots go back to, I was an operational guy that ended up with the, the RDSH Zenap farm by accident, we'll just say. Um, and, and VDI was one of those things as we look at solving problems, um, there was a whole lot of stuff that happened from 2000 on, right? Um, that's really important. I think Gabe probably criticized nine out of ten things I did um, during that time frame because, you know, technology, we we're breaking ground, right? We we're trying to do things, and technology was developing and answering to problems that we didn't even know existed. So I think for the team that's on this call, it's, it's important for them to know that you're not just getting a couple guys selling product here. It's, it's This team has been involved in this industry for a very long time, longer than some of us want to admit. <laughs> True that. Yeah. Cool. And uh, a couple of little shout outs here uh, on the phone. We also have a few folks from uh, FS Logics. Uh, uh, we got Jason Beach, who's the uh, marketing manager for FS Logics. We got Matt, Matt Quigg, who's the uh, one of the marketing um, managers for FS Logics as well. Uh, we have a couple of count guys on the phone, Kevin Brown and uh, Robert Kadish. So if you have any questions around pricing or any of that, we got guys that can answer those questions. And then finally, from Zentegra, we have our practice lead around FS Logics, Mark Henderson. Um, so we have a lot of good people on the phone that can answer a lot of great questions. So don't hesitate to ask questions throughout the uh, presentation today. Uh, so just a quick agenda overview. We're gonna start off with a quick introduction. I, I like polls. I like to do a couple quick polls 
also tells me who's paying attention and who's not. Um, and then we'll jump into a quick introduction and set up the stage for an awesome demo from Dave. Uh, and then we'll jump into a demo. And then finally, we'll cap off with who is Integra. And then finally, we'll open the lines up for Q&A. You can type them in and or we can unmute you. So you, you raise your hand, we can uh, unmute you. And then we'll close the webinar. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, items. Uh, everybody is on mute. Um, but if you do have a question, please feel free to type it in the Q&A dialog. And as I said, at the end, uh, we will you know, open up the lines. If you want to do a live question, we can unmute you if you, if you want to speak up and do it at the end of the session as well. Um, and that is it. So what I want to do is have a couple of little quick polls here because uh, I like polls. It also helps us cater the conversation. So the first poll is simple. Um, you know, I currently use FS Logics today. So I'm going to launch that poll and give about 10 seconds for everybody to take an answer. So if you can uh, take a minute to click your answer and then I'll share it. I'll give about 15 seconds, try to get at least 80% participation. Should have game host music in the background. All right, so I'm gonna close the poll. Thank you everybody for participating and sharing. So we have a good, good uh, spread of folks on the phone today. So we have some folks that own it, we have some folks who want to evaluate it and not sure I want to find out. So you're all in the right place. And like Dave said, you have a lot of good experts on the call today. All right, my next poll is another easy question. Uh, I currently use Office 365 today, and that plays into the conversation a little bit today around VDI, how it interacts with uh, Office 365 um, and kind of the type of exchange you're using. So I kind of fill in the gaps a little bit there. And I'm curious if we'll get any no's. All right, we'll wait about. Hey, I've got one customer that uses us for Lotus Notes. I didn't even think you could still do that. So, um, wow. you know, if there are any no's out there, please quantify why, you know, Lotus Notes, group-wise, um, you know, whatever it may be. All right, so we're going to close the poll and give it a little share. So, again, good, good spread of answers here. Uh, almost 50, you know, pretty good spread between the hosted exchange and on-premise exchange. We'd be interested to talk to you, the folks who are still on-prem and what your hurdles are. And I have a feeling today will help you solve one of those hurdles. Uh, and then anybody considering it, it'd be, it'd be actually interesting to hear why you're considering it. So, uh, and, and what's your hurdle? Is it security, your industry you're in, uh, et cetera. So hopefully, you know, definitely reach out and would love to hear the use cases around that. All right, my final poll. Um, what type of virtual desktop do you primarily use? So pick the one you primarily use. So do you use a pooled shared desktop? Do you use a static persisted desktop? Do you use published desktops or do you just use the combination of all three? Because, uh, you know, you have a pretty diverse crowd in the uh, end user community. So I'll give about 15 seconds on that. And we're going to close the poll in three, two, one. And a good spread here. So, you know, I'm guessing for those who use pooled, you're going to you're going to love what you see today. Uh, again, around it's the focus here is Office 365, but also easing the pain of, you know, VDI management with Office 365. And then for those who use published desktops, we'll talk about application masking and where that can play nicely into published desktops, but also around hosted exchange as well. Um, and then if you use a combination of all three, you know, you're going to walk out of here with some good food for thought uh, around FS Logics today. So hopefully, you know, this is life without FS Logics. Uh, and we're going to pass the baton over to now Mr. David Young, who is going to take us through a quick, quick uh, introduction into who is FS Logics, uh, what they do, and then give us an awesome demo. So, Dave, I'm passing it over to you. And awesome. Thank you much. I love that uh, screenshot. If anybody hasn't seen the Aaron Parker video, uh, quite funny. Um, he's got a one that he did with his uh, sister. So don't make rude comments about the lady and the uh, Prezo because that is his sister. Um, but it's very funny. It expresses a lot of that frustration. So, all right. So Dave Young with FS Logic getting this PowerPoint going. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Office 365. And it's really the big buzzword now. Office 365 has made our VDI deployments harder because literally what's happening is we're saying, hey, Microsoft, go handle the mail problem. We don't need it on-prem anymore. And there's a whole lot of things that get drug along with that. And I, I want to remind everybody, it's not just 
outlook that we struggle with. That's usually the first thing. Mail's usually the first thing that bubbles up. But there's all these things that follow along. There's OneDrive, there's my, you know, my Teams, my OneNote, my Link, all this stuff that has, in a VDI realm, a need for caching. And I thought it was interesting in that poll that we saw that a lot of people are doing persistent desktop. And if you heard me speak many, 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 many years ago, when I was at VMware, I used to say, you know, the utopia in world is a non-persistent desktop. And the reason being is IT can just manage that single image and we can push it out. I can do updates to that single image and push it out. And life is wonderful. Yes, life is wonderful from an IT perspective, um, not necessarily from an end user perspective. And, and what happened in the industry is we tried to take the physical desktop with this non-persistence and build it in the data center, um, and, and then we had to build on top of it our profile, our data, our apps, all that stuff that made the experience usable to the end user. And by doing that, because of a lack of technology at the time, we did things that may not be so great. Like um, three good friends of mine did a road show about uh, there's 100 things wrong with my VDI deployment, and 99 of them are folder redirection. I think that was the title. It might have, might have it off a little bit. But ultimately... <laughs> I've got 99 problems and folder redirection is every one of them. That's the one, yes. So, you know, they <laughs> talked about that. And, and why was that? Well, you had some jerk like me trying to engineer around this and said, well, if I keep, keep my pods down small and I use folder redirection, I can get this persistence problem dealt with and make it look like it's all there, but it's not really all there. And literally, I knew I was causing a scalability issue, but it was able to solve that problem, so we'd make our design limits a certain number so that we could do that stuff, right? Well, then people went over the edge, and, and I'm not going to name anybody directly, but, you know, you ever heard of redirecting app data roaming or app data local? Right. Um, you know, those are things that you might not want to necessarily redirect. Right. Um, because there's a whole bunch of implications on that. Right. And as we took redirection to the final level, um, it causes performance issues. Right. And the bad part is, is that's all we had to do at the time. That, that was the only tool we had. Right. Um, until FS Logics came along. And this kind of leads into where FS Logics comes from. You know, we're an innovator, right? We go out and we see these problems and we want to solve them, right? Um, really, really important. We're not just about private data center or public cloud or physical, right? We can transform all of those, right? Um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that as you go through what I call the journey of this transformation, you may be in a different spot, right? So we can assist with that by helping you make your infrastructure of sorts so that it's VDI friendly, right? And end user friendly so that we can make sure that that end user's experience is what they want to be. I want to introduce the team here really quick, and this is important. Um, who cares about the names? What I want you to do is look at their hair, right? Um, a lot of gray haired old farts, a couple bald farts in there. And the reason, except for the sales guy, they always pay for good hair, but the important reason to understand that it's a bunch of old farts here is this isn't our first time at this rodeo, right? Mr. Goodman, he's done this, I think, four times. I don't want to age him beyond what he should be aged at, but he's done this several times. Randy Cook, right? He, he's done this multiple times. I think he's the man that created the Novell file system, right? So when we look at all this stuff, right, we have some people that it, this is not their first rodeo, right? And I want everybody to think back. Um, Gabe, you remember back when you were living in Ohio and you were doing consulting, right? You remember those days? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Remember your first Citrix farm you built? Sure. Yeah. Would you do a Citrix farm today the same exact way? Oh, absolutely. No, of course not. <laughs> he's, get, he's, he's harassing me. I would have I to reset not. my ICA browser <laughs> service so many times. Yeah, exactly. So the, the short of that is, Every time we do a project, we learn things, right? And we learn different ways of doing things, and we update things and all that good stuff. And that's really, really important when we start to think about the technology, right? So we've done this several times, right? And every time we make that iteration, it drives innovation. And the important part about the innovation is some of the stuff that FS Logix brings. Um, I want to show you that Mr. Goodman was standing in a hole. Um, and got a, an award. We got best of synergy and best new technology, right? 
um, which are huge awards, right? And this isn't our first time winning it, right? We got it in 2015 also. So it, it shows that we're innovating, we're driving things that are changing the way that the industry can do things. So let's talk a little bit about our products. We have four major product sets. It's at masking or Java control our profiles and Office 365 containers. I'm going to cover what app masking does really quick because I want you guys to see all this. It's really, really important. This to me is exciting. Um, for the record, I am certified software architect number three. It's a badge of dishonor that I wear very, very brightly. Um, and when I say badge of dishonor, um, if anybody has ever tried to do app virtualization, it's hard right? There's so many moving components. We've got to worry about this. Is it inside the bubble? Is it outside the bubble? And, and we never got what we all desired, right? Which was 100% app virtualization, right? Just throw an app anywhere. It's just going to work, right? We never got to that utopia. And as we start to look at all this stuff, it became very difficult to make the applications work like we wanted to. And ultimately, what that resulted in is we built out farms, right? App A doesn't work very well with App B, so I have it in a silo, right? And you can't have just one. you got to have redundancy, et cetera, et cetera. And as we start to look at that, what we do is we end up creating these groups and silos for different problems, right? The legal team needs a certain set of applications. The sales team needs a different set of applications, right? Accounting needs less applications or more applications. It, it just ends up in a whole lot of image nightmare and and we end up setting off boundaries and we publish one application on one set of servers and we don't end up with what i call an optimal user experience right we don't get to use our infrastructure as desired and with the fs logics approach we're like the heck with that let's take these silos let's combine them down put all of the applications into a single image right and, and that gives me the ability when the user logs in to say, Mr. Knuth, you're given, you need PowerPoint and Adobe Pro, I think, and, and maybe Visio. Those are your tools or your trade, right? And I only show him those appropriate applications. I only reveal or unmask those appropriate applications. And then when, you know, um, Pete logs in, we want him to have the AI and Outlook. It's really important that he has Outlook, right, so he can send emails, and Excel spreadsheets so he can track all his orders, right? So we give those applications to that person or group. And then when I log in, the only thing I really care about is Visio and, and Google Chrome, right? So that's all I get, right? I get Visio and Google Chrome. So it allows us to take all those applications, throw them into a single image, and by having them within that single image, simplify and flatten my infrastructure. Instead of having silos for app A, silos for app B, silos for app C, now I have one big flat infrastructure that serves up app A, B, and C, yet only to those users as appropriate. And this is game changing, right? I mean, Gabe, you've analyzed the industry forever and, and you see all this stuff. This to me is game changing from an IT perspective because ultimately we're native, right? We don't have to do anything special, right? And it allows applications to run in their native format and just, just work, right? Um, no special packaging or sequencing that you have to figure out. It's, it's a fairly simple process. And I'll show that process here in a few minutes so that you can actually see a live Office 2016 um, masking and take place. All right, so David, really Kevin briefed me on this. What we're doing. Uh -huh. oh, sorry about that. When Kevin briefed me on this years ago, you know, 20... 14 whenever whenever yeah, this was about that to was come so out. long ago that was like when we had 10 customers right right but i i, I told him because it was still in like project mode like it had a project name or something and i told him he should have called it project face palm because it was so simple like why hadn't anybody thought of this before to just put all the apps into your base image and then hide them that you know yeah. it, it's it's interesting you say that because when he showed it to me my head about spun off of its, you know, off the neck here because I was just like, how how can you do that, right? And then he, you know, he gave me the challenge, gave me some code, and he's like, play with it, right? And I don't know if anybody on the phone has ever followed me, but one of the things I used to do when I was at VMware is I'd torture my kids um, by putting them on a VDI pool, and they had their during school VDI pool and their not school BDI pool, so I could restrict the games from and all that good stuff. Um, pure torture to those kids. And I was like, wow, this would have taken managing those pools for those kids 
um, down to just a very, very simple thing, right? One image, all applications, all games, anything they wanted, all within that image. So it really does um, cause us to, you know, take a second guess. And it's total opposite of what I was learning and what most people on this phone learn as far as app management, right? Um, about segregation and isolation and all these wonderful things. So it is a game changer. We'll do a demo on that here in just a minute. I want to cover Java because it's our next small pie. Here you can see all the different apps showing. Here's Java. So Java, for me, this is a just a problem solver, right? I don't know an, a, a vertical that doesn't have a Java problem, right? Um, I used to have a, a firewall guy I worked with, a very good friend of mine by the name of Carl, and when we would struggle with things, he would say, Dave, you can't deny what you must allow, right? So when we start thinking about security, I must allow my customer to run Java 1.42 because the FS Logics website where I enter my time and, and um, reporting for my expenses is written off of Java 1.42 because we wrote it 20 years ago, right? Well, I don't want to deny that. I, I want to get paid. Very, very important thing. Right. So, you know, I can't deny what I must allow, but I also must allow users to safely go to other websites and use the latest and greatest version of Java. And for this, this is just a simple rule editor. You go out, you, you say what your trusted app or URL is, you assign it to a version of Java and you basically set it and forget it. Right. You don't worry about it anymore. And if we were to upgrade the FS Logics payroll and expense system, from 1.4 to 1.6 or 1.8, let's say we go to the re most recent, then we could change that rule so it goes to the latest and greatest. But this ultimately allows me to allow those unsecure, older versions of Java to go to sites that I trust. Big easy button. Gives me that flexibility so I don't have to worry about it anymore. In the government space, which I'm in the process of building out right now with FS Logics, and shout out to my team, Matt Quigg and, and Kevin Brown, um, we see Java as a problem everywhere, right? Um, you know, just as an example, a quote-unquote EMR healthcare system is being written today, and I think it's being written in Java 1.7, right? That's what they started on. It's going to be finished up in 1.7. It's already out to date, right? Um, they're going to spend a billion dollars on that EMR system. Does any taxpayer on the phone want them to upgrade that for a billion dollars to the latest and greatest version of Java every month or year, whenever it comes out, right? The answer is no, right? So let's restrict that and control it to something appropriate. Any comments from uh, Gabe or or Pete on Java? I think that's pretty much it for Java, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's uh, probably pretty much it. It's one of those things. If you have multiple versions of Java, you need this, and if not, your eyes have rolled into the back of your head. Exactly. Or they're in denial. And if you're in denial, please uh, go back to step one, right? Um, so let's talk about our profile containers. So this Dave, uh, before part... we move on real quick, um, there are yeah. some questions about app masking. Do you want to deal with those now or do you want to deal with them in the demo? Let's deal with them now. Okay. Uh, so the first one came up from Dave Logan. Uh, when using app masking, how does that enforce license compliance? You know, license compliance is a great question. Um, ultimately, we are very, very friendly, and you've made me change my mind. We're going to go to, and we're going to do an app mask right now so they can see that. <laughs> so app masking and license compliance is going to be your best friend. I'm going to fire off my little script that I use for doing app masking, and it's going to fire up a whole bunch of stuff so you can see it. Ultimately, what it boils down to, if it does not exist from the user perspective, you need not license it, Okay. Um, I have backing from Microsoft on this. I oddly enough got pulled into an audit for one of our customers over in the UK um, when we first got started here. And Microsoft had come in to do an audit, right? And the way it happened is customers said, okay, you need a user account to do an audit. So they created a user account. Let's call it Tiddlywinks, right? And so the auditor went off and ran Tiddlywinks in his login, ran a whole bunch of executables, collect information about what applications were installed, came back very, very perplexed. And in his best British accent, I'm going to try and be British, you don't have any software installed, right? Um, and it was very, very confused of why there was no software installed on these machines, right? And this is a very large customer. So that caused, you know, Spidey Sense to go up. And the admin said, oh, that's because we use FS Logics. And the auditor was like, well, what's that? And he tried to explain to him, and I think the guy's eyes rolled in the back of his head. 
So they called me up and said, can you help us explain this to Microsoft so that they can conduct an audit? And so I said, yeah, I, I'll explain it. So I said to the auditor, I said, ultimately, we remove the application from the file system so it doesn't exist, and we only reveal that application to the user that is entitled, and therefore, you know, you have 100% license compliance. And the guy said, well, how do I audit that? I said, really, really simple. You ask them for their FXA file, which stands for authorization, and you ask them to see the Active Directory group that's tied to that. And you look at the FXA file, and let's just say, because we're going to do Office 2016 here, it's for Office 2016. You go to the Office 2016 Active Directory group, and you count the number of objects in it. If they have 10,000 objects in it, and they're licensed for 20,000 licenses, speak very, very carefully, because you know they may want to reduce their license count. Um, if they have 10,000 objects in there, and they're licensed for 1,000, ask them for a check, right? They've over-entitled, right? And the guy's like, that's all I have to do? And I said, yeah. He finished up, he was supposed to be there for three days doing his audit. He finished up his audit in like three hours, right? Because it totally changed the way to do the audits. Now, we do have sign-off from the audit team. If anybody ever gets audited on this, there is a document they wrote on how to properly audit in an FSLogix world. And you can get that document from the auditing team if they come out and do an audit on you. So it, it, they love us, right? They absolutely love us because you're going to see here in a second how awesome this is. So... I am going to create a package, and we're going to call this the Pete, Dave, Gabe, and I'm going to spell everybody's name right. There we go. So now you guys all know I'm not making this up. I'm going to put some random numbers in there. I didn't do an automated um, build here, and I'm going to hit OK. It's going to come up. It's going to ask me what application I want. So I'm going to go ahead and choose from an installed application. We're going to do Office 2016. So here is i got to find office 2016 there it is it usually takes me longer to find it than it does to do the rest and i'm gonna hit scan now don't anybody take off for a cup of coffee because you don't have enough time this takes about 35 40 seconds and boom you're going to see that we're pretty much done and when it hits done i hit okay and i get a list of rules and it says 343 objects need to be hidden in order to make office 2016 disappear so i'm going to move this window out of the way a little bit so i can show you guys a couple things so over here on the right we have the install folder for Office 2016. Notice there's folders in there, right? Up here on the top left, and I'm gonna move that over just a wee bit, we have add and remove programs. So I'm gonna come down to where Microsoft Office is. Usually it takes me longer to find it than it does to do the next part of this magic trick. Um, just in case anybody wanted to know, I wanted to be a magician when I was a kid. So Mr. Kevin Goodman has enabled my lifelong dream. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Goodman, um, because here we go. I'm going to make Office disappear. So I click this little button, which puts us into test mode. I hit yes, and boom, we're going to see some changes. Notice my icons change down at the bottom, right? They all go to white. That's because the association is cached for those files. Notice this folder disappeared, okay? It's gone. It's removed from the file system. Watch what happens when I refresh add remove programs. So I refresh, no more Microsoft there. Now, just in case you're like, wow, that's a pretty cool one-trick job, Dave, now put it back, right? And, you know, make the woman reappear, right? So here we go. I'm going to take the rule off. And as soon as I take the rule off, file system returns. I come back to add remove programs, and I hit refresh, and there's Office 2016. And notice that my stuff is now reassociated, right? So I'm able to instantaneously remove Office from a machine. So how would my practical application of this be? I would go in here and I would create an assignment, right? So I would say, yes, I want this rule to hide office from everyone. And then I would add a group and we will call that group office 2016. And if I was actually going to modify AWS's stuff, I would see a good icon here in a minute. It's not gonna be good because it's, I'm doing this on a demo system. So I hit okay. And I would say, don't apply this rule. So what it says is, deny all, allow the Office 2016 group. And then I'd place the FXA and FXR file into a special directory so that when a user logs in, it says, hey, I have Dave Young here. He's a member of the Office 2016 group. He gets Office 2016 and allow him to see it. Mr. Knuth logs in. And we say, uh-uh, no, no, he gets Office 2013 or Open Office or whatever it is. And it would reveal the appropriate version of Office for that user during their session on that infrastructure without having multiple images. 
I'm going to pause for a second because I know this may be earth shattering to some people. It was earth shattering to me. Um, Gabe, I want to open this up for further discussion if you so desire. All right. So there's two other questions about app masking right now. Um, the first one is from Leon Cowan. Uh, what's the process for managing app updates on a flat M? Actually, you know what? Hang on. We're going to get to that one next. There's one in here from John Dunbar asking, does FS Logics recognize KMS licensing? So we change the app in no way, shape, or form. Okay. Um, so KMS, absolutely. It, it's just going to work, right? Um, I did want to show one additional thing that we could do um, for um, additional licensing constraints, right? Is I could use an environment variable. Let's just say I had an environment variable that I set to Visio, right? So when a user logs in, they would get this environment variable set, right? And I'd say yes. If the if the environment variable is set to Visio and the value is yes, I want them to be able to um, see the application. So I change this to don't restrict them, right? Maybe I change that to if the environment variable is no, right? Um, that means they didn't come from our environment. I don't want them to get the application. This is so that we can uh, enable things like um, device-based licensing, right? Um, it gives us that more granular control over what we're doing with that application. And if you noticed here, you'll see that I had multiple different things. I could do a network location. I could say with process. I mean, there's all sorts of things I can do here, right? The world is your oyster in regards to that. So it gives us a lot of flexibility in what we're able to do for that application. So, um, okay, so let's do, we've got two and a half more uh, here because I know we've got a lot to go on to with Office 365 and Profile Container too. But uh, so if I want to update an application, what's the process for updating unique apps since now we've got all the apps in one image? So what you would do is you'd open up your image. Ultimately, you'd apply your mask to deny all, and we would just work on Office 2016. So it would not know that any other version of Office was there. Go through my app update, create it, close down my image, republish it, whatever you know version of you know publishing you're using, and be off and rolling, right? Um, it, it really simplifies, and I get customers that get on a very regular schedule. They say, hey, Monday through Friday, we work on app updates. Um, the next Monday through Friday, we do QA, and the following week, we publish them, right? So they, they're able to shorten that time frame down so that they can roughly push out updates as often as they so desire. It's really going to depend on your internal process. Right. I think there's a when Gabe and I talked when he interviewed about coming here, um, he had a um, I, I don't know if he said it to me personally or if it was actually an email. Gabe, do you remember what that was? No, I don't. Something about really one image. Right. You could really get to one image. And the answer oh, yeah. is yes. <laughs> you know, minus right? politics. <laughs> yeah. Nobody believes that. Right. Until you start doing it. Um, I've got customers that had 30 or 40 images that because of politics, we're able to get down to you know five or six, right? The one boundary we do not fix, I wanna make sure I'm absolutely clear with this is, if you have an application that must run on Windows 7, we don't fix it, it will run on Windows 8, 10, 12, right? What we do is we say, make one image for Windows 7, right? Don't have multiple images, have one image for Windows 8, one image for Windows you know, 10, et cetera, et cetera. So we really do, sink down the amount of images you can have. Um, common sense does apply, though. We'll, we will say that in the final answer. Any other questions, Gabe? Uh, last Pete. one. What's that? Or Pete. <laughs> or Pete. <laughs> Pete, get in line. Um, <laughs> uh, last one's from John Decker. Oh, he just popped in another one, too. All right. Does Citrix app layering make app masking unnecessary while allowing the base image to be smaller? Can I, can I so answer? So it that? actually is the opposite. Um, anybody that's done app masking um, will see that it's fairly simple, right? And the application, and we sell a lot of app masking in app layer worlds, is because if you're a large enterprise, the complexity of all those app layers starts to become, as nicely as I can say it, a boundary, right? As nice as I'm going to say it, it becomes a boundary. It can cause you deployment timeframe issues, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have many customers doing is saying, and I'm going to just use Office as an example, we'll throw all Office into a particular layer, a layer, and we'll call it the Office productivity layer, 
and then we use app masking to present the appropriate version of Office to the user. Because let's think about app layering. And I'm gonna just, let's say, Gabe, you, you use PowerPoint all the time, right? I mean, you're like a PowerPoint god, right? And, and, and if I had Gabe on Office 2013 and he wanted Office 2016, with app layering, it's like, all right, well, I need to recompose your image. I got to repush that layer, which means a whole bunch of work has to go on, right? And if Gabe called me up and said, Dave, I'm five minutes from a meeting with the CTO and the CEO and the CFO of FS Logics, and my PowerPoint needs to be updated because they sent me some new slides, how quick could I get it to them, right? Well, with app masking, because it's already there and I can reveal the application, I don't have to reconfigure anything. I can just reveal the application. I can have it to him as quick as he could log off and log back in, or if he really knows what he's doing, he could do a GP update, get in the right group, and boom, the application would just appear, right? So very much we are complementary to app masking, okay? Or excuse me, app layering um, with app masking. Can I, can I have anything uh, to add? Uh, kind of a, a view point of view as well? So, you know, the, the two, two, there's been three questions around this topic. And so two things. One, I would invite anybody on this call to head to Zentegris, you know, dot com forward slash events and jump on my, you know, I do an app layering uh, uh, hands on workshop. And when you go through that, you're going to see it's a complete paradigm shift. Um, so one of the things that, you know, Dave, you, you know, you're showing is how easy FS logics truly is. And you're going to, and if you take FS logics and put it side by side, the ease of use is where, where FS logics is going to edge out app layering. App layering is, you know, this mythical thing that everybody loves and it works. However, it's a complete shift in how you're going to manage your images. And it's also a big shift in, you know, how you're going to build your app layers. but to your point, Dave, it is complimentary and they work hand in hand together. And when they are put together, it's pretty powerful. So exactly. Yeah. And I encourage you guys to go to those workshops because, um, you know, you get two sides selling to you and you know what, I'm from the show me state, right? Showing me how it works together, um, is always better, right? You're going to be able to see how that's going to work in your environment and what the true layers of complexity are that you're going to have to deal with. Any other questions around app masking? Uh, I would say let's go ahead and continue on. There's, uh, I'll All right. So well let me close on. this stuff out. Let me go back to my PowerPoint. Um, I just got to hit cancel enough times to make this all go away in the right spot. There we go. Discard. Uh, I want to get this out of here because if I mess it up, my PowerPoint won't work if I have it masked because, well, it just won't work. So let's talk a little bit about um, our containers piece because – this is the next piece of technology that is really game changing. So we have our profile container and, and what that is in and, and profile container and Office 365 container technology is interchangeable. What we solve with them is different, but the technology is interchangeable. So what we say is, hey, go out and put all your data on, on SIFS SMB storage, right? Um, nothing special. It doesn't have to have its own database or anything like that. And what we do is we containerize that in a VHD, okay? Now, very, very important. All we're doing is a VHD mount. If you've been in IT long enough to remember symbolic links and junctions and things like that, that's all this is, right? So we mount a, a remote disk and present it as if it was local. And that changes entirely what we're doing. Right. I have a customer, Holster Bro Commune. I love to tell the story because the data is so great. They were running 3,400 users on UPM, right? And if you're familiar with what UPM does, it's fancy roaming profiles, which I refer to as fetch and retreat. Go out to the file server, get a file, pull it back so I can build my profile. And oddly enough, when I do that, I'm pulling it from the file, you know, the file share, which is on some kind of storage array. I'm actually writing it back in the virtual machine to probably the same storage array, right? Um, I just have it in a different layer of, of the world, but I'm still on that same storage array. And ultimately that causes a lot of IO, okay? So a whole separate commune, 3,400 users, they were running 31,000 IOPS all day long. They replaced their UPM profiles with FS Logics, and it dropped down to 2,500. 
And, and, and that was earth shattering to me because when I saw the marketing notes, I was like, hmm, somebody messed up here. 25, you know, 31,000 to 2,500 seems too good to be true. So I actually called the team over at Holtz Pearl and said, hey, I'd like to, you know, do an analysis on this data because it just seems too good to be true. And they're like, yeah, we know. And so we did an analysis on it. And, and I had this huge aha moment, right? If I save something to my profile and I don't touch it, with roaming profiles or UPM or any of that other technology, it gets transferred back and forth, right? With FS Logics, it doesn't, right? So let's take the worst case. I put a four gig DVD on my desktop, right? Because I was gonna watch Batman when I got bored in the data center one night, right? And I don't touch it for six months. Every time I log in, that's being transferred back and forth, right? But I've never touched it. So we're just repetitively moving unneeded IO. With FS Logics, yes, it's written to the disk. Yes, I can see it, but I'm not transferring it back and forth. The only time I'd actually utilize it is if I was actually opening the file, digging into the contents of it, and then it's at a block level, just as if it was local. So it really changes what I'm doing from an I.O. perspective, right? And we all know in BDI, I.O. is king, right? So what we do is we intercept for the, for the profile container, we intercept to um, C users, and with Office 365, we intercept multiple containers to basically app data local Microsoft question mark, right? So I'm gonna throw up and show you a quick demo on this because sometimes seeing it is more important. So here we go, we'll just do, we'll do the profiles demo real fast. It's gonna fire up some stuff. So here you can see, I got the registry up. I'm going to bring up a whole bunch of stuff here, right? So here is my share, right? with my data in it. If you double click on it, you'll see I've got a couple VHDs on it, right? And here's my config, very, very simple, a few registry keys, and here's disk management. So you'll see that I have these virtual disks mounted. Now I've assigned a drive letter to the profiles so that we can actually go in and see it. So let me explore, oh, maybe I haven't assigned it. I will assign a drive letter, there we go. And you'll see when I explore this, there we go, that the data looks just like my profile. There it is, right? There's all my profile information. And if I compare that to this other one right here, let me get to it. Apparently I've got too many windows open. There we go. If I compare that to my actual profile, let's go into there. So we're gonna go to C users, um, there we go. You'll see that when I go in here, these two folders are the same, right? You'll see that this has a, fold, a file in it called something that I should delete. If I come down here, it's got a file in it called something I should delete, right? And it's the same. It's just a mount point, right? Now, very, very important. All mount points or junctions are not created equally. So I want to show you we have a whole bunch of stuff here. Here's my demo user going to volume three profile. I have my app data local Microsoft Outlook. There we go, going to volume four in cache mode, right? I've got a whole bunch of other stuff going on too. But we're ultimately intercepting all this stuff so that it just works. Now I have here an example of a bad junction mount, right? Notice that we see this word junction. I see the volume information, all that good stuff. Now certain things won't work across that by design, right? Uh, when you cross a junction, things like add, change, delete notifications don't get transferred from one side to the other, which means if I'm doing something like OneDrive, it's just not going to work. If I'm doing Office in protected mode, I'm going to run into problems, et cetera, et cetera. Look at the FS Logix junction. Here's my profile. Notice it just shows up as a directory, right? I don't see that junction. We're masking it. What we're doing is we're watching on both sides, which means, watch this, I'm going to fire up Outlook. I don't know how long it's been since I fired up Outlook. We might have a little bit of new mail to get it. Maybe not. We'll see. But I'm going to fire up Outlook. It's going to do all of its add-ins. It's doing all of its stuff. And here in a minute, you're going to see that I probably have about 8,000 messages, right? And it says that this folder's up to date, right? Um, boom. I'm going to go through these. And you notice I can just click on them. Right, it just it, it works. It doesn't. There's no delay. There's no lag. This is awesome because I'm in cache mode. Right, all my data is in that VHD. I can even search on something. Not there. Let's go here. Let's search for the word diamonds. 
right? So we do diamonds, boom, it comes back with stuff because we're intercepting the search database, right? I add a word onto here and it goes diamonds are and it, and it narrows it down. And let's go to my best uh, forever, boom. There we go, you can see it finally narrows down to nothing, right? Um, the last big show on this is let's take a look at OneDrive, right? So the biggest complaint I hear about OneDrive is in a shared environment, we just want it to look like it does on the user's PC. See my OneDrive? Being intercepted, right? Here we go. You can see if I go into Prezos, here's today's presentation, right? That I am running, right? And, and it just looks like it's normal, native. It's being intercepted at the lower disk level, but it just works. So let's hop back real quick while we open up for questions to the PowerPoint because the last thing I have to talk about is a thing we call Cloud Cache. And Gabe, do we have any app? mass or excuse me containers questions at the moment uh the only one is uh how is this different or better from what res does uh and pete answered this uh via the the chat but i felt i feel like it might be a good point to give him a chance to answer that live yeah answer yeah, so, that live pete <laughs> <laughs> so no that's a great question uh john Th thanks for the question um now, you know, as everybody, hopefully a lot of you know, I spent uh, almost two years at Res uh, Software running product management for Workspace. I actually, my last project before uh, Avanti acquired Res was working with FS Logics to find out how we complement each other and, you know, where there's some minor overlap. And in, in, in the end of the day, they're complementary. And really where Res is going to fall down is in the OST world. They're never going to be able to, you know, solve uh, the OST conundrum in, in a shared BDI or in Zen app. Uh, they're never going to be able to speed up search, uh, et cetera. So, you know, that's where FS Logics is a great shim in the, you know, what I would call user workspace management world. Uh, where Res excels, obviously, is, you know, back to Dave's example with app masking, when those icons go white, well, you don't want white icons on the desktop. So you want to be able to remove the icons and add them you know, based on the user. So you can use that, you know, use Res and AppSense to, you know, do this, do the same, you know, uh, show the desktop the way the user needs it. So control uh, the experience, put context on the experience and, and enhance FS Logics. So at the end of the day, they're complementary. Uh, you know, could you use FS Logics exclusively? Yeah, you could, but you're going to lose a lot of the granular profile management functionalities that they both have to offer. Now, yeah, I will say this AppSense does have a, they claim to have a feature and I'll just leave it at that. You know, they claim, um, but I will tell you right now, FS Logics hands down is the best, uh, you know, feature, you know, for OST management and general profile management on, you know, hands down in the industry right now. So and it's important and to, to add know a too, if you look at OneDrive and SharePoint and all those things too. I mean, it, exactly. You know, that's... It's never just the OST guys. It is always, I got the OST. Now I want my OneDrive. Right. It, there's always the follow on. And, and this is where the FS Logics suite adds the adds the, the complementary stuff. Right. We can take that from just the OST all the way through to, you know, the entire product suite for O365 or any Office product for that matter. It really isn't tied to Office 365. Um, one other thing I wanted to really hit on that that Pete was talking about was Absence, Avante, all that stuff. It's really about user environment management that we have applied to try to make the user environment build out as we need. And we love enforcement. We have nothing against enforcement. We are very complimentary because now we can reduce the amount of enforcement, which is CPU cycles and IO that needs to be done. Because if the app link is correct, if the background on the desktop is as we desire, why change it or have to set it, right? So we become very complimentary to that because we can speed that up. If you've got an AppSense deployment, we're going to be the, the turbocharger to that. We're just going to make it faster so that you can get more CPU cycles to your users to solve business problems. Dave, yeah, do agree. we have documented I, 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 processes for moving from UPD to profile containers? We yeah. do. Um, UPD, I love UPD. They sell more FS Logics than I think anybody else does in the world because people go down that path, they run into barriers, we'll just call it that, and the next alternative is to upgrade to FS Logic. So there is a process for that migration. Um, if you need that, if you've gotten to that point, please reach out to this team. 
um, we can help you with that. Between Zintegra and FS Logix, we can get you there so that it is a very small process for you. Uh, and there's one more question, which hopefully we can get to quickly so we can end reasonably close to the time, uh, is uh, how is this different or better than VMware writable volumes for storing user profiles? Because this is really tied to the user, not to the environment. Um, I have many, many customers that have tried to go down that path. I came from that world. Um, there are boundaries there that end up causing sticking points. And, and we can be complementary to that because this really truly is to the user not to do the machine level. It's just a different way of implementing. And, and we have a lot of customers that switch over just because this goes down and, and it happens quickly, right? Average time for an app, um, um, excuse me, a profile or Office 365 proof of concept is about two and a half weeks, right? Um, it takes 30 minutes to set this up. That's it. Really, it takes like three minutes. You've got to listen to Dave's stories or whoever your engineer is stories. So, you know, 30 minutes is set up. It's that quick and easy. We do not have any infrastructure that goes in between. And, which leads me into my next point of discussion, we are very, very agnostic to all those worlds. Let's say you don't have a homogeneous environment, right? You got a whole bunch of mixture stuff, right? Um, we are very, very complementary to that. And with our Cloud Cache product, we can help you transcend both those environments so that you know, you can do the best of both on all those environments. You know, one of the topics of discussion, because it is fresh, Azure had a huge outage yesterday in the South Central region, right? Personally affected me, right? And, and if we look at that, you know, my VDI desktop, I couldn't get to my profile. So it was basically useless because I didn't have my stuff, right? Um, if we look at what FS Logix brings with its new introduction to Cloud Cache, what it gives us the capability to do is all these things we talked about, but instead of writing it directly to the SMB storage, we kind of change the path. We write it to a local cache file, which greatly reduces it, and then we put it out on the storage, right? So we're basically doing lazy writes out to the storage, keeping everything we're reading local so that if anything ever happens, right, I can have my local cache, and then I can reconnect at a later date and bring it up to date, right? The great place where this comes into place is let's take a look at Azure, right? Let's say you're running Azure AWS, and, and both of them are not impugned to their outages. And if anybody believes that will be the last Microsoft or AWS outage ever in the world, um, re-roll your dice because that's not true. It's going to happen again. There are so many things that happen in data centers, right? It's just it's bound to happen. And if we look at what the end user does, right, it's so important to generate revenue, this is a very simple way we can replicate for you on behalf of you to those different disparate storage infrastructures so that you can have both and run it. So if you did, whoops, I went too far, lose your storage one, right? You would then automatically fail over without impacting the user to storage two, right? And then when it comes back online, we bring it all up to date until it's green again, right? Um, so it gives us that capability to not only put high availability in for the end user, but high functionality, right? So that I can now take advantage of those two worlds. Um, so it gives us a lot of great things. Um, couple differentiators, right? You guys can all read this, but it's never just the OST. I said that three or four times now. I'll say five more if I need to, right? It's always about more things. Um, app management piece of it, right? Being able to manage those applications. It's the big easy button, right? We, we spent so long doing it the hard way, right? It's just the big easy button now. Um, very important thing from us that not all vendors do, and I want to highlight this one, is plug fest. Every time, all the time, every time, I think that came from a movie, that we have an interoperability problem with another vendor, it's because they don't attend plug fest. We identify all of our problems at PlugFest and resolve them. That's how we get our PlugFest you know, certification. And anytime we have a problem with somebody, it's because they didn't attend PlugFest. So keep that in the back of your mind when you're looking at this stuff on how do you pick a good vendor, right? Um, you know, first question is, did you go to the PlugFest? And if they say, what's that? Um, maybe move on, right? They don't know what that is, right? Because it's not good for you, especially when we're talking about filter drivers or mini filter drivers, right? So very important thing to think about when we look at that. Gabe, I'm going to open it for any further questions. I'm at the end of the FS Logics piece. I really want to talk and pass back to Pete because there is a ton of value that Zentegra brings to this. We've had a lot of discussion here. Um, anything else, Gabe, that we have any last-minute questions on? 
Uh, there's one question from John Decker about cloud cache uh, that I can take. Uh, he asked, does the cloud need to be hard down in order to switch to local cache? Or if there's a network slowdown, you can manually use only local cache. And it does have to be hard down. Uh, but, you know, there are ways. It, it just has to be inaccessible. So if, you know, you really needed to switch because the cloud part was slow, you could probably force that at the network level somehow. The thing is, is that uh, since cloud cache is, is, is pulling, the cache part of cloud cache is pulling down the the actual blocks from the VHD container and the profile, those live in that local cache. And so if there's random slowdowns, as long as that data has already been stored in the cache and accessed, the user won't notice. And if it's just pulling down a few blocks here and there, again, we kind of you know help absorb that. Uh, so in general, the user's experience should be should be pretty good across the board. And that's 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 what that local cache enables. Uh, but you know, any more challenging problems from there probably have to be dealt with in a different way, but we can certainly take advantage of the architecture to help that. Um, cool. Pete, go ahead, man. All right, so just a quick close out. So if you have any other questions, definitely jot them down. I'm gonna leave about a couple more minutes at the end, but I just wanna do a quick, you know, who is Integra and give you guys insight to why and how we work with uh, FS Logic. So, you know, for those who don't know, our CEO is a guy by the name of Andy Whiteside. And Andy, you know, created Zentegra out of the need to enable our customers and form true partnerships. Uh, he, he was an SE at Citrix for about seven years. And when he interacted with the various partners in the community, he just wasn't satisfied as a quote unquote partner and uh, how he was treated by his supposed partner. So he wanted to change the game and change how partnerships work and how we enable and interact with our customer base. So you'll see that through a lot of the trainings we do uh, through the workshops we do, through the webinars we do. Um, so, you know, we really stand by the notion of being a true partner. So when we work with FS Logics, it's a two-way street and we work together as opposed to, hey, FS Logics, bring us the customers. Uh, so that, you know, we really stand by the, the, the term partner and Andy's truly built a great company. So what is Integra? We're a reseller. So we can resell FS Logics, Citrix, and a handful of other uh, products out there. Uh, we can also consult so we can come in and implement, uh, help you get FS Logics up and running, uh, POC it, uh, you know, and, and help you understand how the technology works. And then finally, we can be an advisor. So we can, uh, you know, tell you, answer some of the questions around, you know, the differences between app layering and FS Logics, the difference between, you know, the various UEF, UWM pro products out there, user workspace management products out there. We can be an advisor for you, a trusted advisor. And really the goal here, and one of my favorite parts of this job is, you know, I can build a solution stack. So if you are using Citrix and you are using, you know, ESXi underneath, it doesn't matter. I can build the stack and I can, you know, I can put it on one invoice and you can work with one vendor to build a great stack um, of solutions. Um, so these are the various partners. Uh, you can see, you know, our, our core business is Citrix and we try to enable Citrix, but we sell all these other partners and implement them. We only partner with partners who are, you know, we know we can implement and we can consult on and we can advise on. We don't just add logos for the sake of adding logos. Um, and then finally, you know, the services we offer. We offer a wide variety of services from basic consulting. Uh, so you can do fixed projects, you can do block of hours, so time and materials. We also have an MSP practice, so we can do full end-to-end -end managed services, whether it's uh, moving to Office 365, helping you get up and running. We even use FS Logics in our own Zentegra cloud. So if you do adopt our cloud, you're going to be using FS Logics. And then we are also a consumer of FS Logics in our VDI desktops as well. Um, and then again, we offer various degrees of free micro assessments. So definitely take advantage of those. Uh, and you'll see those live on the site in the next you know, day or so because I'm revamping the services page. So why is Integra? I, I put a triangle, triangle up here because the triangle is the strongest shape in nature, right? And if you look at kind of the three points, we're focused. We're a top platinum partner in the country. We're one of uh, FS Logic's top partners. Uh, we excel in everything we do. Um, and our focus is being a true partner. Um, we're capable, right? We are growing pretty fast, but we're also growing, you know, healthy and smart. Um, so you, you're going to see more and more Zentegra as you go through 2018 and 2019. And we're experienced. So if you go and look at our staff, we all have spent, 
you know, 10 plus years in the industry, if not longer. Um, so that's a that's a, a, a good pro and, and we really understand end user computing. And then finally, we're committed. Uh, you know, our clients are number one. Um, you know, you can see this by all the free assessments we do, the free trainings we do, the free workshops we do, and the thought leadership. And then finally, the client is the center of our world. Uh, we try to get you the Citrix Synergy. We try to get you the other various industry events by investing monies and dollars back into you so you can get there and ease some of the budget pain of going to events like VMworld, Synergy, and other key industry events throughout the year. And then finally, here's some calls to action. All right, if you want a demo and you want to learn more, reach out to us. I'll do a follow-up email. You'll have all our emails. Um, and let us know. We'll love to demo this. You'll see how easy this is to get up and running. Uh, if you want POC assistance, you know, Mark Henderson and I are, are the guys on staff that help with FS Logic, So we can get you up and running uh, and get you going with a simple POC. And again, you'll be surprised at how easy FS Logic truly is. And then finally, when you're ready to purchase, let us know. We can help you get the licenses. We have a great relationship with the sales team uh, and a great relationship with FS Logix. So with that, I'm gonna hand back to the Q&A and make sure there's no uh, any other questions out there. If you have a question, now's the time to ask. If you wanna ask it live, feel free to raise your hand through the hand raise function. We can even unmute you. So if you want a live question, let us know and I'll see if Gabe, if we have any other questions in the, uh, the question queue. No questions, just a statement from Bob. He says, I agree, Zintegra is a fantastic company. Well, thank you, Bob. <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting from that perspective. One of the most successful ways that I have been able to sell in the past is by doing what I call solution selling. It's not just my piece. It's the entire stack. And working with Zintegra allows me a very easy avenue to fall into that solution selling, right? I don't have to say, you know, wait, 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 Pete, don't forget about it. They're going to need some kind of user environment management. You know, they, they are able to come together with that expertise to say, yes, for you, Mr. Customer, based off of all the things you've told us, this is what's going to be best for you. So solution selling is great, and having that partner that knows how to do it is awesome. Cool. So I think, uh, I think we've exhausted all the questions. And uh, any last words from Dave or, or Gabe? No, nah, if we uh, if we found out we missed a question or something like that, we'll make sure to follow up afterwards. And if you guys have any questions or if we didn't answer a question as entirely as you would like, uh, which happens a lot once you get three of us on a call and we all start getting a little long winded, uh, you know, reach out to us. Uh, Dave Young did most of the talking uh, and <laughs> you can find us at, uh, at, at FSLogix.com or LinkedIn uh, or just D Young at FSLogix.com. I'm Gabe Knuth, G Knuth at FSLogix.com. And uh, Pete, you have a Zentegra email address. Uh, I'm uh, just Pete at Zentegra.com. I keep there it you easy. Go. So, uh, cool. so, don't, so don't be this guy. And if you are interested in learning more about FSLogix, definitely reach out. Uh, and we're here to help. And we thank you all for attending our webinar today, the first of a series of this year. And uh, again, thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your Wednesday.